Welcome again. And if you are visiting this channel for the first time, you are highly welcome. Let's look at the anatomy of the duodenum. The duodenum is the first region of the small intestine, and this is followed with the jejunum and also the ileum. This is going to be the first lecture series of the small intestine. Please look forward to that of the jejunum and also the ileum. But for the purpose of this lecture, we would be limiting this to just the duodenum. So write down with me as I unfold the anatomy of the duodenum. <laughs> The duodenum is the first region of the small intestine, as we've stated, and the small intestine is the region between the stomach and also the large intestine. This is the stomach up here, and in this space is where we have the large intestine. And of course, this first region of the small intestine is the duodenum, and this is the duodenum. After the duodenum, we have the jejunum, and this is the jejunum. Then this is followed with the ileum. The ileum is the terminal part of the small intestine, and this is what finally opens up into the large intestine. And the specific region of the large intestine that it opens into is the cecum. From the cecum, it goes up into the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid, then that is how it goes down. And this is the large intestine highlighted in white. So we say that the small intestine is a region between the stomach and the large intestine, which is highlighted in white. And of course, the first region of the small intestine is the duodenum, followed with the jejunum, then the ileum. Then talking about the functions of the duodenum, the duodenum, as we know, that it forms part of the GI tract. It also helps to create space through which we have the emptying of bile and also the pancreatic juice. So we have bile produced by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. After the storage in the gallbladder, there are times where it will be needed for the process of digestion. And the only region of the GI tract where this will be emptied into is the duodenum. So we have the bile duct that carries bile, releases it into the duodenum where it is used for the emulsification of fat. We also have the pancreatic duct, which is the duct through which the pancreatic juice is released to also be emptied into the duodenum. So the duodenum, apart from creating structural alignment for the GI tract, it also creates a space through which the bile and also pancreatic juice are released into the duodenum. The bile is used for the emulsification of fat, which tends to uh, further break down fats. And pancreatic juice, because it contains enzymes, amylase, lipase, and tripase, it helps to completely digest carbohydrates, protein, and also fat. The food that is coming out from the stomach is partially digested until when it gets to the duodenum, where these secrets are released to completely digest these food substances for the process of absorption to take place. Because we know that the digestive system, apart from breaking down food substances, it is also through it that nutrients are also taken up into the body. So it is the pancreatic juice and the bile that helps to further break down these food substances to the smallest unit that the body can absorb. So the specific region of the small intestine where they release the bile and also the pancreatic juice into is the duodenum. So that can also be taken as a function of the duodenum. Let's go further on the duodenum. The duodenum is a C-shaped region and is about 25 cm in length. And this is the duodenum highlighted in red. And if you try to extract this region out, this is the kind of presentation that would be seen. This is a C-shaped configuration. And that is what the duodenum represents in terms of structural alignment. So it is C-shaped in shape. And you see it lining around the head of the pancreas. This is the pancreas highlighted in yellow. The pancreas has a head. This is the round bordered head. So you see the duodenum around the head of the pancreas. So this is how it curves around the head of the pancreas. And of course, it begins at the pylorus. The pylorus is the terminal region of the stomach. And this is the region highlighted here. And around the pylorus, we have the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is a sphincter that helps to regulate or control the rate at which food substances are released into the duodenum. So at this region marked in black to this region marked here is where we have the extension of the duodenum. And this point where it terminates is called the duodenal jejunal junction. It's just for us to break down the name. As I've always said on this channel, if you have to 
two named composite joined together. When you break it down, you know exactly what it means. So it means that the junction where the duodenum become continuous with the jejunum. So at this junction is where we have the termination of the duodenum. So the region marked up here, where we had the pyloric sphincter running through this course to this region where it becomes the jejunum is where we have the duodenum. Going further on the duodenum, the duodenum out of all the three subregions of the small intestine, it is the widest in terms of caliber. So when you take the diameter of the small intestine, you see that it is the widest when you compare it with the jejunum and the ileum. And this is where the duodenum is. And of course, in terms of length, it is the shortest. We know that the entire length of the small intestine is about 6.5 meters. And just 25 centimeters of this length is where the duodenum represents. So this is the duodenum, the region arrowed in yellow. The duodenum is the most fixed region of the small intestine. We try to establish why this is so. We know that the bulk of the small intestine is of intraperitoneal presentation, and that is why we have the emergence of mesentery that helps to hold the small intestine to the posterior abdominal wall. I have highlighted this in my previous overview lecture on the small intestine. If you've not checked that lecture, oh, please kindly go and do so. But the initial segment of the small intestine, which is the duodenum, is not an entire intraperitoneal organ. If you look at the first two centimeters of the first part of the duodenum is what has an intraperitoneal presentation. So this region, you have all the surfaces of this region being enclosed by peritoneum. This means that this region will be mobile. Then the remaining three centimeters of the first region of the duodenum and also the remaining region of the duodenum are of retroperitoneal presentation. So this means that it is just one surface that is related to the peritoneum. So you have the duodenum being held in place and you have the peritoneum lining just one of the surface. As it is lining one of the surfaces, it's helping to hold it in place and that is why it is fixed. So the duodenum out of all the three subdivisions of the small intestine is the most fixed region because of the retroperitoneal presentation of the bulk of the duodenum. This is just the initial two centimeter of the duodenum that is of intraperitoneal presentation. And of course, we know that the jejunum and the ileum are of intraperitoneal presentation. And that is why they are mobile and also has mesentery that helps to connect them to the posterior abdominal wall. So let's drive into the subdivisions of the duodenum. Remember we said that the duodenum is of C-shaped configuration. So if we try to write down the letter C, and also note the path by which the configuration runs, we would be able to easily establish the different subregions and also attribute the specific names that they had. So the duodenum is subdivided into four sections. And the knowledge that we'll be using to establish this subdivision is the configuration of the C-shaped mark. So the first region is the first superior part, and this is the first superior part. If you try to initiate the writing of the letter C, this is how it begins. So the upper part is the first part, and of course it's the superior part because it is seen above. Then the second region is the second descending part. Of course, after running through this course, the next region is to descend down in the cost of writing the letter C. So this second region is the second descending part. And you see it's actually descending. And this is the second descending part. And the third part is the third horizontal part. This is the third horizontal part. After this descending pattern, the next course is to run transversely or horizontally. That is why it is the third horizontal part. Then we have the final region of the duodenum, which is the fourth ascending part. It is the fourth part because it's the last part. And of course it ascends up and that is why it's the ascending part. So this is the fourth ascending part. So we have the first superior part, the second descending part, the third horizontal part, then the fourth ascending part. So if we try to establish how the C mark is run, we would be able to easily establish the first subdivisions of the duodenum. Also to add that there is the superior duodenal flexure and an inferior duodenal flexure. In the quest of establishing this C configuration, there is a point where the first superior part becomes the second descending part. And at this curvature is where we have the superior duodenal flexure. 
And of course, inferiorly, we have an inferior duodenal flexure where the second descending part becomes the third horizontal part. There is a curvature that is created around this space for it to run horizontally to the other side. So you should also know that we have a superior and an inferior duodenal flexure in the C-shaped presentation. So let's take each of these subdivisions one after the other to see what they present and also to highlight their specific features. For the first part, we say it's the first superior part. The first superior part is a continuation of the pylorus of the stomach. This is the pyloric region of the stomach, which is the terminal portion of the stomach. And just after this region is where we have the first region of the duodenum. And this is the first superior part of the duodenum. This is about 5 cm in length. We know that the entire length of the duodenum is 25 centimeter. So the first 5 centimeter is the first superior part of the duodenum. And this is the first superior part in this C-shaped presentation. And of course, as it emerges from the pylorus, it runs to the right. And this is where it hangs. And this tallies with the first lumbar vertebra. So this level corresponds to the first lumbar vertebra. And of course, this is the first superior part of the duodenum. Also to drive in more on the first superior part, remember when we tried to establish the intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal presentation of the small intestine. We said that the bulk of the small intestine is intraperitoneal. But for the duodenum, we have some form of variation in terms of being intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal. For the first superior part, which is about five centimeters, the first two centimeters of the first superior part is of intraperitoneal presentation, which means that it is intraperitoneal that all the surfaces are covered by peritoneum. But for the remaining three centimeter of the first superior part is retroperitoneum, which means that it is held in place and covered on one surface by the peritoneum so that this can be held in place. And that is why we try to establish that the duodenum is the most fixed region of the small intestine. Because apart from the remaining three centimeter of the first region, also the second, the third, and the fourth region are also of retroperitoneal presentation. So they are held in place and just one surface of it, of course, is covered by the peritoneum. And that is why they are the most fixed region when compared to the jejunum and also the ileum. It's just the initial two centimeters of the first region of the duodenum that is of intraperitoneal presentation. And we know that Organs that have intraperitoneal presentation are mobile because of the emergence of mesentery. The longer the mesentery, the wider the range of movement that they will exhibit. Because the initial two centimeter of the first region of the duodenum is intraperitoneal, which means that this region will be mobile because of its intraperitoneal presentation. And that is why we have the hepatoduodenal ligament helping to hold this specific region in place to deliver. This is the hepatoduodenal ligament that is highlighted in red. This ligament, all we need to do is to break down the name hepatic and duodenum. It means it's the ligament that connects the duodenum with the liver. The specific region of the duodenum that it connects is the upper border of the first superior part. This is the first superior part of the duodenum. So you see it at the upper border of the first superior part. It connects specifically to the porta hepatis of the liver. The porta hepatis of the liver is the region where structures enter and leave the liver. So it helps to connect the upper border of the first region of the duodenum to the porta hepatis. And this is important in creating a form of structural support for the duodenum, by helping to hold it in place. Also to her that the hepatoduodenal ligament is a portion of the lesser omentum. The lesser omentum is seen to connect the lesser curvature of the stomach and also the upper part of the duodenum to the liver where we have the second portion of the lesser omentum as the hepatogastric ligaments. So to drive more on the first superior part, there is a region that is referred to as the duodenal cap. And the duodenal cap is the first two centimeter of the first part of the duodenum. So this is the first two centimeter, and this region is the duodenal cap. And this region tends to present a form of clinical relevance if you look at the interior wall of the small intestine, generally it's seen to be thrown into circular folds, which are called plica circularis or Kirkring's folds. These folds are circular folds of the mucosa lining of the small intestine. In the region where we have the duodenal curve, the mucosa lining is seen to be smooth. 
during barium meal examination. This barium meal examination is done when meals that contain barium sulfate are swallowed. And this barium sulfate meal are highly visualized in X-ray. And this is the basis on to which this meal is used for this examination. And as it is swallowed, a shadow presentation of the duodenal cap is seen during X-ray. And this shadow presentation also appears to be enlarged. And this is as a result of the smooth muzzle work characteristics. This is used to establish or diagnose the disorders of the GI tract, such as constriction, inia, ulcer, or even obstruction. So let's go to the second region of the duodenum, which is the second descending portion of the duodenum. And this is the second region. Superiorly, we have the superior duodenal flexure, and inferiorly, we have the inferior duodenal flexure. And in between this flexure point is where we have the second descending region of the duodenum. And it corresponds to the L1 to L3 lumbar vertebrae. So from L1 to L3 on the right side is where you see the second descending part of the duodenum. And at the midpoint of the posterior medial wall of the second descending part of the duodenum is where we have the emptying of the bile duct and also the pancreatic duct. This is the gallbladder where bile that is produced in the liver is stored. The gallbladder is the storage medium for bile after which it is released through the cystic duct, and this is the cystic duct. There is a union of the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct to form the common bile duct, and this is the common bile duct. It is through the common bile duct that the bile is then released into the duodenum. Also in the pancreas, this is the pancreas, we have the pancreatic dot. The pancreatic dot allows for the release of pancreatic juice, which contains enzyme trypsin, amylase, and lipase that are responsible for complete breakdown of fats, carbohydrates, and also proteins. So the common bile duct at its tail end has a sphincter that is called the sphincter of the common bile duct. Then the pancreatic duct also has a sphincter, which is called the sphincter of the pancreatic duct. These two allows for release of their secrets into the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And this is the hepatopancreatic ampulla, which is a uniform or common part for the bile and also the pancreatic juice. After which this is finally released into the duodenum. And this is controlled by the sphincter of Hordy. From the sphincter of Hordy, it is then released into the major duodenal papilla. Then you now see the secrets or the release in the duodenum. That is how we have the release from the liver and also the pancreas into the duodenum. And we've established that the bile is used for the emulsification of fat and the pancreatic juice is used to also further break down carbohydrate proteins and fats. Also to add that below this opening is where we have the beginning of the mid gut. We know that the GI tract is divided into the fore gut, the mid gut, and the hind gut. From the oral cavity to the esophagus to the stomach, up to this level, that means we have the superior first part of the duodenum. Then we have the half of the second descending part of the duodenum as the fore gut. Then below this region, we have the remaining part of the second descending part of the duodenum, the horizontal part, the ascending part as the mid gut. So the superior half of the second descending part of the duodenum is part of the four gut, while the inferior half of the second descending part of the duodenum is part of the mid gut. So you can see that the duodenum, a region of it, forms part of the fore gut, and also a region of it forms part of the mid gut. This alignment up here, to this alignment down here is where we have the second descending part of the duodenum. So let's go to the next region, which is the third horizontal part of the duodenum. This begins at the inferior duodenal flexure, and this passes transversely to the left, crossing the midline. So this is the third horizontal part of the duodenum. And you can see it actually runs at the horizontal part to the left. This is about 10 cm in length. It is the longest subdivision of the duodenum even though this image does not depict that. And it is seen at the level of the third lumbar vertebra. So this is seen at L3 vertebra level. 
So it marks from this region down to this region. So going to the last region of the duodenum, we have the fourth ascending part, which is the final part of the duodenum. And this is seen to run superiorly to the inferior border of the body of the pancreas. This is the pancreas, and this is the head. The inferior part of the body of the pancreas is where it extends to superiorly. So it tries to ascend, and that is why it's called the fourth ascending part of the duodenum. And this is the fourth ascending part of the duodenum. This level begins from the third lumbar vertebra to the second lumbar vertebra. Because it tends to ascend, so you see that the lumbar level tends to also go up. So it runs from the third lumbar vertebra to the second lumbar vertebra and is about 2.5 centimeter in length. This level terminates at the duodenal jejunal junction, the junction where the duodenum becomes the jejunum. So it terminates at this region. So this is the jejunum, and at this point is where it terminates. Also, at the duodenal jejunal junction, there is a ligament that is called the trans ligament or the suspensory ligament of the duodenum. This, this is the ligament highlighted in red. This ligament tends to connect the duodenal jejunal junction to the right cross of the diaphragm pulp. We know that the diaphragm helps to partition the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So we have a ligament connecting the duodenal jejunal junction and sometimes the third and the fourth region of the duodenum to the right cross of the diaphragm. This is helping to create a form of structural support for the duodenum and also around the point where it becomes the jejunum. Also to heart that is clinically relevant because it allows for easy movement of food within the lumen of the duodenum and also the jejunum because we know that the point where the duodenum becomes the jejunum there's going to be a form of transition in terms of structural configuration so it tends to hold it in place so that food substances are able to pass through it easily and also freely also to add that during developmental process that any form of malformation that occur to this ligament may lead to malrotation of the duodenum. Because if you see it, you see that it's helping to hold the duodenum in place. So if there is uh, abnormality or structural deformation of this ligament is going to cause the malrotation of the duodenum. So the duodenum will not be well positioned and this can affect digestive processes. So let's look at the relations of the duodenum. Anteriorly, we know that the liver is located anterior to the stomach. And of course, this extends down to where we have the duodenum. So anteriorly, we have the first part of the duodenum being eaten by the right lobe of liver. So we have the liver. Anteriorly, we know that the remaining part of the duodenum is retroperitoneal, which means that it is covered on one surface by the peritoneum. So you have the duodenum, then you have the peritoneum lining the surface. So it also forms part of the anterior relations of the duodenum. If you go more superiorly, you have the fundus of the gallbladder. This is the gallbladder where bile that is produced in the liver is stored. And it's also seen in the anterior part of the duodenum in the upper region. Then you have the transverse column. The transverse column is a region of the large intestine. And you see it crossing the, the duodenum. And this we also have as anterior relation of the duodenum. Then we have the superior mesenteric artery. This is the superior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery emerges from the abdominal aorta. Even though we have the abdominal aorta at the posterior part of the duodenum, the superior mesenteric artery emerges and it runs anteriorly. And that is why it is seen as part of the anterior relations of the duodenum. Then going posteriorly behind the structures that we have after removing the duodenum, the structure that has seen behind the duodenum, ha the right kidney, the right urethra, and the right renal vessel. This is the kidney at the posterior part. Of course, we have the urethra. This is urethra highlighted in black. And we also have the renal vessels that emerges at the hilum of the kidney. They are also related posteriorly to the duodenum. And these are the renal vessels. Then we have the left renal vessel on the other side. The left renal vessel is also related posteriorly to the duodenum. We have the inferior vena cava. This is the inferior vena cava highlighted in blue. We know that the inferior vena cava collects venous blood from the lower part of the body. And of course, it's seen to be located close to the iota. So the next structure that we see is the iota, which is highlighted in black. This is also seen behind 
the duodenum. If you see it, the way it runs, it runs behind it downwards, also the inferior vena cava. Then we have the gonadal vessels, which include the testicular and the ovarian artery. The testicular and ovarian arteries are emergence of the abdominal aorta, and this is where you have them highlighted in black. They are also seen behind the duodenum. Then we have the swast muscle. The swast muscle are also posterior relations of the duodenum. We have the common bile duct. This is the gallbladder where the bile is stored. And we have the common bile duct through which this it is released into the duodenum. The common bile duct is also seen to run behind the duodenum. Then we have the gastroduodenal artery. The gastroduodenal artery is a branch of the common hepatic artery, which branches from the, the ciliac trunk. So it branches like that, and you see it running behind the duodenum. Then we have the inferior mesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric artery emerges below the superior mesenteric artery. We know that the superior mesenteric artery is seen to be related anterior to the duodenum, where we have the iota at the posterior part. If you go more inferior, you have the emergence of the inferior mesenteric artery. And this is seen behind the duodenum, just has the iota. So we can try to add to these relations to expand our knowledge in the comment section, and I'll be looking forward to this. So let's look at the blood supply. The blood supply of the duodenum, of the different regions of the duodenum are different. For the superior part of the duodenum, it is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk. And this is the celiac trunk. We know that the celiac trunk gives the common hepatic artery. This is the common hepatic artery. And from the common hepatic artery, we have the emergence of the gastroduodenal artery. This is the gastroduodenal artery. Where we have the superior pancreatic duodenal artery. And this is the superior pancreatic duodenal artery. This superior pancreatic duodenal artery divides into the anterior division and posterior division. So the anterior division and posterior division are seen to supply the first and the second region of the duodenum. So we say that the upper part of the duodenum is supplied by branches from the common hepatic artery which of course is from the celiac trunk. This is the anterior division and the posterior division of the superior pancreatic duodenal artery. So we can say that the upper part of the duodenum is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk. So going to this inferior region, the inferior region of the duodenum is supplied by branches from the superior mesenteric artery. So from the superior mesenteric artery, we have the emergence of the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. This is the superior mesenteric artery. This is the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery, which also further divides into anterior and posterior divisions. This is the posterior division and this is the anterior division. And this division supplies the second and the third region of the duodenum. So you can see that the upper part of the duodenum and the lower part of the duodenum are supplied by different vessels. The upper part is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk, while the lower part is supplied by branches from the superior mesenteric artery. So the region that is left now is the fourth ascending part. So the fourth ascending region is supplied by the first jejunal artery. And of course, the first jejunal artery is also a branch of the superior mesenteric artery. So we see that the upper part is supplied by branches from the ciliar trunk, while the lower part is supplied by branches from the superior mesenteric artery. So the venous drainage of the duodenum is through the superior mesenteric vein and also the portal vein. The lymphatics are drained into the superior and inferior pancreatic duodenal lymph nodes, which further drains into the celiac lymph nodes and also the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. Let's check our understanding of this lecture through the following questions. And the first one is to describe the subregions of the duodenum. The second question is to describe the relations of the duodenum. Then the last question is to highlight the blood supply of the duodenum. Thanks for watching. Let's meet again.